weeks, we're going to uh, do a Sunday school lesson, one each week on each of the Ten Commandments. And it will serve to bring us towards the end of our time in the law and the gospel. Uh, there will be multiple men up here, um, our brothers like Noel and Edgar and Jerome and I believe Michael Dinger as well. But uh, I have the first commandment and uh, I believe I'm signed up for the tenth as well. So let's begin with the first. And what we want to aim for this morning is better understanding the first commandment out of the Ten Commandments. And what God requires of us with it, what God forbids us to do with the revelation of the Tenth Commandment, and consider ways personally before God that we might repent in Christ and obey. So please uh, engage this morning not only with me, but... um, in consideration of the Lord and in your fellowship with Him. So, the first commandment, on the handout, I've categorized this, this, uh, this outline by the, the catechism questions. What is the first commandment? The second major point is what is required in the first commandment. And the third point is what is forbidden in the first commandment. And then the catechism questions are underneath there. And then I left blank section uh, below each one of those so that you can fill it out. So if you look under the first major point of your handout, it says under, there's an underlined phrase, exposition of the first commandment. These five points are what we will go over. So you could fill that in in the line and then add any references or any key things that are helpful for you. So let me answer the question from the Catechism. The first commandment is, you shall have no other gods before me. Let's look at Exodus 20. I'm going to assume you're familiar with all of what we have been learning prior to today with reference to the law and the gospel. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on expounding the rules of how to Uh, interpret the commandment. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the relationship between the commandment and the gospel, though I want to not forget that. I'm going to focus on explaining the first commandment, what not only what it means, but what it requires and forbids. So the nature of the the lesson is law. Uh, Keep that in mind as uh, God in His grace, convicts you of your sin to remember uh, that Christ is your only hope, not only of justification, but sanctification and glorification. And uh, turn to Him for strength and repentance as you see your own sin. Okay, in the Exodus 20, I wanted to read the first two verses. And God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord... Your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. So, this commandment deals with God as our God. We haven't been redeemed like Israel from a land externally. We've been redeemed from the bondage of our sin by the blood, not of a Passover lamb, but of the lamb of God. Christ Jesus. So this commandment has even more weight considering our redemption in Christ Jesus. Okay, so the first thing when we look at the the commandment, it's not many words, but let's go through these five points. First of all, it's a commandment. God is, uh, the mood is imperative. He's not stating a fact. He's commanding you with authority as your God. This is not a suggestion. It's not a preference of God's. 
It's not even him strongly urging you to do this. It's an authoritative command from God to his creature made in his image. I think that's worthy of of, uh, emphasizing. And we know that the gospel, uh, we're no longer under the law, but under grace. But that under grace is not antinomianism. In fact, the, the design of the gospel is that we might be freed from our sin by the blood of Christ, redeemed with his ransom to serve the Lord and obey him. So <clears throat> the fact that this is a commandment and is authoritative is established by the gospel. The second point, it is the first and foremost command. So if you look at Matthew 22, verse 37, Jesus is having an interaction with a, a scribe, but he, he says something here about what is the greatest commandment in the law. And Jesus said to him in verse 37, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. What I want you to see here is that in the two tables of the law, the first four commandments and the last six commandments, we have love that is uh, directed and summed up as love towards God. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a graven image, uh, so forth. You shall not take the Lord your God's name in vain and remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. But then the last six commandments have more of a horizontal uh, emphasis. Love your neighbor as yourself. Honor your father and your mother, and so forth. The fact that the two tables are arranged that way is not by accident. It's not haphazard. Jesus says here, this is the first and great commandment. He's talking about loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's the first and the great commandment. And the second is like it. So, If there's ever a rivalry between loving your neighbor and loving God, you have a priority. And it will help inform how you ought to love that neighbor that you believe is causing a rivalry. You love God. And out of that table, the first four commandments, the first and greatest commandment summed up in love the Lord your God, out of those four now, as we break them down, the first one is this one. You shall have no other gods before me. It is first and foremost. Uh, Jeff Smith, uh, a pastor at Trinity uh, Baptist Church, quoted this, Obedience to this command is the starting point of all true obedience to God. He likened it into Mount Everest of the commandments. Uh, The next one, it is personal. So we observed here that it is an imperative mood. It's a commandment. We observed it's the first commandment out of the ten. And we also see that God says the word you on your handout. You shall. And in the Hebrew, it's not a plural you. It's a singular you. And so in seeking to observe the text and consider the word of God and God himself in this, he uses the individual and makes it personal. 
um, it emphasizes the personal nature of the commandment. In other words, Ryan, you shall have no other gods before me. You could say that about yourself. It, it, let me give you an illustration. So let's say a family, ha- there's multiple children, and a father says to his children gathered before him, do not disobey your mother in my absence. He's speaking to them as a group. Is that authoritative? Yes. Is it applied to each of them? Yes. But when he looks at one of the children and he gets down like this, and he says, Johnny, you shall not disobey your mother when I, in my absence. It's individual. It carries a, an emphasis and that's the way that God has arranged or revealed His commandment. Uh, the next point is it acknowledges the reality of idolatry. So in the Exodus 23, He says, You shall have no other gods. So that begs the question, are there other gods? Uh, If God says you shall have no other gods, does that mean that there are gods, other gods? The answer is no and yes. And it depends on what you mean when you say no, and it depends on what you mean when you say yes. But let's look at some text to to make this clear. So, are there other gods? No. So let's go to 1 Corinthians 8. Verse 1. Now concerning things offered to idols, we know that we all have knowledge... Knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. And if anyone thinks that he knows anything, he knows nothing yet as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, this one is known by him. Therefore, concerning the eating of things offered to idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world. And that there is no other God but one. So in Corinth, from chapter 8 to the end of chapter 10... There's uh, an issue that Paul's addressing with um, concerning things offered to idols, particularly food. Uh, And he even says in chapter 10 about fleeing idolatry. So Paul isn't just concerned with uh, brotherly love by not making a stumbling block for your brother, but he's also concerned about them misusing their liberty not only with reference to their brother but also with reference to their own soul because if they involve themselves in worship practices that they get this food from they're going to partake in the worship of demons and Paul says I don't want you to do that and he tells them you need to have the right mindset about what you need to do with your liberty look at me I'm an apostle. I have the freedom to take a wife, and I don't for the sake of the gospel. He's just talking about how he lays down his freedoms. Well, one of the things they knew was there's no idols. There's no gods. There's no other gods in the world. There's only one God. I know that. I'm a Christian. So when I get this food that's uh, sacrificed in a pagan temple, I'm not... What, they're doing nothing. They're not worshiping a God. I'm not worshiping a God myself. My conscience is free and clear. I have this knowledge that there's no other God. But Paul's addressing how you ought to use that knowledge. But the whole point I wanted to bring out is the Bible is very clear. There's a, a lot of texts we could go to. So the answer is, are there other gods? No. Well, why is it in the commandment, the first commandment? Why, why would God not? Why would God add that? Well, there's the yes part. 
Are there other gods? In a sense, yes. How so? Let's look at Romans one twenty. And you could write some of these references down. Or um, I'm not going to keep commending to you what you should or shouldn't. I'm just reminding you one last time here that that handout's meant to put this on and write what you think's helpful. Um, <clears throat> no, let's look at, or I'm sorry, yes, let's look at how, in what sense we say yes, that there are other gods. So in Romans chapter 1, verse 20. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Why are they without excuse? Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like the corruptible man of birds, four-footed animals, and creeping things. So, what unbelievers do, and I, I, I want to make, make reference to believers because believers can practice idolatry also. But what unbelievers do is they create false gods with their imagination or with worldly influence. And we know that uh, all that is in the world that is, exists in opposition to, to the Father, to God, is under the sway of the wicked one. Um, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers and principalities. Um, but, let's look at how believers can have false gods also. Galatians 4, 8. So back there in Romans, though, you could see how they exchanged. They made a trade. They said, here's the incorruptible God, the one true and living God, and I'm going to now pick up corruptible image, corruptible, an image of corruptible man, and worship the creature, making creation a God. Now in Galatians 4, verse 8, but then, indeed, when you, that's two believers, did not know God, you served those things which by nature are not God's. So he's talking about with you believers you once served those things which by nature are not gods. You, you had other gods in your worship. But now, after you have known God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you turn again to the weak and beggarly elements to which you desire again to be in bondage? So, What's happening in Galatia, or what Paul is warning them against, is turning back to these idols, these false gods. And it's interesting in Galatians, you know, circumcision is nothing, Paul says. Uh, we know from Pastor Rick's preaching, it's dealing with justification uh, by works. Uh, so when Paul's saying turning back to weak and beggarly elements, there is a relationship between those two. So people make a, a, a God out of obedience to the law. So Christians are not immune to fabricating or picking up ideas and affections that are directed not towards God but to false gods. And the difference is these are being saved and will be saved. They are saved, they're being saved, and they will be saved. Uh, but unbelievers are in bondage. And Paul's warning them that they not back, return to the bondage which they once were in. So, 
idols and other gods do not exist, no, except in the hearts and minds of unbelievers. And believers can fall into the sin of idolatry, but are kept from bondage to it by the Lord. Any questions about that? The yes and no? So, God is commanding in this. He is acknowledging the reality of idolatry. Idols and false gods in the hearts and minds of Satan and the world. And says, those lies which are not true gods, you are not to have them. You are not to treat them as only I ought to be treated. Okay. Last, it forbids all other gods. And we get that in Exodus on your handout. You can see it at the top. Exodus 23. You shall have no other gods before me. So uh, if you haven't ever had anybody explain the commandments like this or ex- explain um, phrases, prepositional phrases, just expound text or heard it with reference to this, that before me, I don't know if you've ever thought about it, but what does that mean? Um, well, it does not mean ahead of me. You shall have no other gods ahead of me. It doesn't mean in front of me. You shall have no other gods like in front of me. I'm here and you're putting that in front of me. Or above me. I'm down here and you're putting a God uh, above me. When he says before me, what he means is in my presence. In my sight. When, When a king sits on a throne and someone comes into the throne room, he comes before the king. And God says from his throne, before me, you shall have no other gods. So let's look at uh, Genesis 7, 1. I just want you to see this phrase in that usage. Then the Lord said to Noah, come into the ark, you and all your household, because I have seen that you are righteous before me. He doesn't say you are righteous above me. You are righteous ahead of me or in front of me. He says before me in my presence. You are righteous in my presence. In my sight. Look at uh, Genesis 17. 1. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am almighty God, walk before me and be blameless. He doesn't say walk ahead of me, walk above me, or in front of me. He says walk before me in my presence and be blameless. So when the commandment says you shall have no other gods before me, it's absolute. Where, is the, where can you hide that God cannot see? If you can find somewhere that God cannot see, you still would not have an argument, but at least you're understanding that this text deals with his presence. So this is absolute. It's, it shows the, uh, it helps give a picture too in his presence. Um, therefore, God forbids any and all other gods. There is one you shall worship all the days of your life. That is the true and living God, who is your creator, your redeemer, your sustainer, and your sovereign. Deuteronomy 6, 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God. The Lord is one. Look at Deuteronomy 4, 39. Therefore, know this day and consider it in your heart that the Lord himself is God in heaven above 
and on earth beneath. There is no other. So this first commandment, now that we've exposited it, um, I want to put a little bit more flesh onto this skeleton, so to speak. A little more meat on it. Just say, let me uh, add some more. This commandment, you know, like in, a, in a narrow sense, when we say no other gods and we think about the Old Testament and we, we know about the Baals and the Asterisks and the Moloks, and then we think about false gods today, you might ask the question, you know, well, how far does this commandment reach? And what does it look like? Um, so I wanna, we're going to get into that, but I want to just read this. This commandment does not reach only to the Baals of long ago, nor merely to Allah or Buddha or the God of the Watchtower Society, but also to anything that rivals God's place of propriety or esteem or worship. For example, we're not going to be found worshiping Allah or Buddha here, but we are not innocent when we trust in our wealth, which the Bible calls mammon. You know you are in union with Christ and have been made the temple of the living God, and rightly have you chosen him by the Spirit. Why then do you now, or would you choose us, other, less explicit gods like mammon? Here's Matthew Henry talks about other gods. To love, to desire, to delight in, or to expect any good from any sinful indulgence is prohibited. Equally, we are not only to allow any person or created thing, however valuable or excellent, to rival God in our affections. It doesn't matter how valuable to you your spouse is. She should not be a rival to your affections to God. Or he should not be a rival to your affections to God. Same with children or friends. All atheism, infidelity, and irreligion is opposition to God, an attempt to be independent of Him. The proud man in his own, is his own idol. So you ask the proud man, well, I don't worship my family. I don't worship money. Yeah, but you have chosen yourself as a God. And you are trusting in yourself and in effect worshiping yourself and you you expect men to worship you because you do that the covetous man makes a god of his wealth which he loves depends upon and expects happiness from the sensualist by his practices worships deities so-called as filthy as any scene in a pagan temple so before we get into what is required that's going to be the next section um, I wanted to remind you of what the purpose of the law is uh, we went through several of those with uh, Cahoon's book uh, but I want to remind you of a couple remember that this commandment is to expose and give you the knowledge of your sin even as a believer I, w- I would even say especially as a believer uh, don't shrink back and re- res- resort to your own good works as a shelter. But let the piercing light of God's law expose remaining sin with reference to this commandment. And remember that the other purpose of the law, or one of the other purposes, is to lead you to Christ. There has never been any hope in us. There's not hope in you now. Um, If there were hope in you, why did Christ come? If there were hope in you now, why does he sit as high priest in heaven interceding for you? Turn to the Lord. Trust in him. Make much of Christ and delight in God the Father through Christ. 
Okay, let's move to the next part. What is required in the first commandment? Um, <clears throat> one, there's three points for the those who are writing this down. You must choose God as your God. I'll leave it there for now. These, I put up there, I didn't put it up here under line, but on your paper it says some, some essential requirements of the commandment. So it's not exhaustive. Uh, and they're not the only essential ones. These are some essential ones. There's much. We could spend a lot of time on this commandment. It, if you looked in here, which I'm, I was thinking about reading, but when I read what it forbids, it was like two pages. This is uh, the Westminster Catechism and Confession, and the larger catechism has a long section on all the different ways and what the commandment forbids and what it commands us to do. So you could get that or get it online and, and read it, and then it has all these references for you to go study if you're wanting more information. But I, I'm, I'm focusing on some essentials with this commandment. And one of those essentials is you must choose God as your God. Remember the preface to the Ten Commandments is, I, the Lord, your God. So you must choose God as your God. Let's look at uh, Joshua 24. Verse 15. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the river or the god of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. He chose. He chose the Lord. This is uh, an illustration of the necessity in this commandment to choose the Lord. Look at uh, this principle in Matthew uh, 6.24. No one can serve two masters, two gods. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. You must choose. You must choose the Lord. And um, here's an illustration. Um, this is one I heard about from a preacher and I read about in a book. Different men at different ages. So they, that was a good analogy. Uh, when a couple decide to get married, they've been courting and they uh, make plans to get married. And the day of the wedding comes... They take vows. They, they make vows to each other before the Lord. I, sh I, I guess you would say to the Lord. Um, but what they, what they will often say when you hear them is, I take you, John. I'm using a common name. I take you, Mary. They're saying, I choose you. I choose you, I take you in commitment. Um, I don't choose Bill or Sally, I choose you. And the commandment requires that you choose God as your God. When he says you shall have no other gods before me, remember the commandments also include the opposites. You shall have me as your God. You shall choose me. 
And when you're practicing sins, like, I was thinking about all the ways in which I try to justify and, and practice sin with my simple heart. And we have, like, a myriad of ways that we can justify things. Um, don't think to yourself, you're not choosing that sin. You are choosing it. The angry man says, I can't stop being angry. And he'll tell his counselor, it's just not within me. I'm not made that way. And I heard, a, a, I think it was Stuart Scott say, well, Jesus Christ was compassionate. Therefore, you need to repent. Because he is the image of God and you are to imitate him. So, when you get angry on a regular basis, you're choosing that, God. To save you, to protect you, to help you get through it. You are making a, a willful decision to go there instead of to God. And God says over and over about these false gods, what can they do? They can't do anything for you. It, when you say... Anger, I'm in a trouble, help me. God says, what is that going to do for you? It's like wood that can't do anything but sit there and fall over. So, you can't choose anger and God. You can only choose one or the other. And God commands us in this text to choose Him. And not only in our words, but in our spirit and in our deeds. Let's look at First Kings 18. I want to give another illustration from the Bible. This is Elijah where there's the test between the false prophets and their Baal. And I'm not going to read it all because it's long. But let's start in 26. I'm... I'm Assuming you're familiar with this. So if you're not, you'll have to follow along now and go back and read it and put the pieces together. Verse 26. So they took the bull which was given them and they prepared it and called on the name of Baal from morning even till noon, saying, O oh, Baal, hear us. But there was no voice. No one answered. Then they leaped about the altar which they had made. And so it was at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud, for he is a God. Either he is meditating, or he is busy, or he is on a journey, or perhaps he is sleeping and must be awakened. So they cried aloud and cut themselves, as was their custom, with knives and lances, until the blood gushed out on them. And when midday was past, they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, but there was no voice. No one answered. No one paid attention. We, it's easy for me to laugh at that. And I think that's good in a sense. But at missing the point, it's not good. When we resort to sin to deliver us, it's like that. Oh, help me, help me. And I'm like cutting myself, help me. And then Elijah's saying, no one's answering because it doesn't exist. It can't help me. So let me keep going. Verse 36. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, and I am your servant, and that I have done all these things at your word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that you are the Lord God. And that you have turned their hearts back to you again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust. And it licked up the water that was in the trench. Now when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. They chose. They chose the Lord. Prior to that, they chose Baal. 
They're praying, they're prophesying, they're cutting themselves, they're offering all, time, all day long. They're choosing Baal, choosing Baal, and then the Lord reveals himself, and then they choose the Lord. So the commandment, command, this is just an illustration of what the commandment requires, that you choose the Lord. Next is you must know God as your God. The catechism question up here, what is required in the first commandment? Up at the top it says the first commandment requires us to know and acknowledge God to be the only true God and our God and to worship and glorify him accordingly. So I'm kind of taking from that and making these points. Choose God is uh, uh, where I would liken it into acknowledging him. Know God, that's in the, the catechism, and then to worship and glorify him. So the next part I will put up here is you must worship and glorify God accordingly. So, this no, what is this no? Uh, when we say, when God says, you shall have no other gods before me, and the opposite, he says, you shall have me as your God only. He is the true and living God. It requires us not only to choose him, but to know him. And what kind of knowledge ought we to have of him? Look at Jeremiah 9. 23. Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man glory in his might, nor let the rich man glory in his riches, but let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me. That I am the Lord exercising loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these I delight, says the Lord. The Bible uses those two words, understands and knows. It's, it's, uh, it's putting them together. You know how kind of like in Exodus he says the Lord forgives transgression, iniquity, and sin? He could have just said sin, but he says forgives transgression, iniquity, and sin to talk about how comprehensive his, his forgiveness is. Well, here, when it uses these words which are similar in our own understanding, understand, know, it's stressing the comprehensiveness of the, the familiarity that we ought to have with the Lord. We ought not to just have a distant, personal, unacquainted knowledge like you have of a, a president of the United States. I've never met Abraham Lincoln, but I know about him. And if somebody said, Ryan, do you know Abraham Lincoln? I could say, yeah, I know him, in a sense. That's not what God requires of us in the commandment. And it's not only a knowledge about someone with whom you are acquainted at a surface level. When we used to uh, spend regular trips going down to Bolivia, I got to meet Christians down there. And I remember off the top of my head right now, Pastor Mateo. Um, and even what all this time passed, I'm very grateful for that. I'm grateful to the Lord for him. And uh, find him to be a, a very encouraging man. But I don't, I know him at a surface level. I know that he's a believer insofar as I've seen what I've seen. And I know that as we both are in union with Christ, we have fellowship together in the Lord. But do I know him? Am I intimately understanding him? No. I, I would say my knowledge of Pastor Mateo is surface. Not that it's meaningless, but it's just not deep. Well... In the same way, our knowledge of the Lord ought not to be shallow. The commandment requires that we 
not merely have a shallow knowledge of him. But we ought to have an intimate knowledge. Um, I heard uh, some of these phrases from others. It ought to be a joyful knowledge. A thorough knowledge. Not comprehensive, but thorough. All-encompassing of yourself. Vibrant. Look at Psalm 139 as an illustration of the psalmist and his knowledge of the Lord, how it comes out in song. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You see how it's personal? You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down. You are acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word on my tongue, but behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. You have hedged me in before, behind and before, and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit, or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the utmost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me. And your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall fall fall on me, even the night shall be light about me. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide from you, but the night shines as the day, and the darkness and the light are both alike to you. For you formed me in my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book they all were written, the days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. How precious also are your thoughts to me. O God, how great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they would be more in number than in the sand. When I awake, I am still with you. Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God. Depart from me, therefore, you bloodthirsty men, for they speak against you wickedly. Your enemies take your name in vain. You see, his knowledge of the Lord leads to a righteous indignation. Do I not hate them, O Lord, who hate you? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with a perfect hatred. I count them my enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. And see if there is any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. So that's an illustration of what God commands us in this commandment. That you shall have no other gods before me. And you shall have him as your God only. And you shall not only choose him and have an acquaintance with him, but you shall intimately know him. How is that communion possible? That's open-ended. How is that fellowship with God possible? Um, through the gospel, um, through the work of his son, we, um, can be reconciled to him. And, um, you think of like the intimate relationship of having him as a father and being adopted. Yeah. One of those examples. Yeah. Amen. The glory of the gospel. Look at what God has done, is doing, and will do to bring about obedience to this commandment. The fruit of it seen here in the psalmist. The joy of the psalmist. The delight he has in God. Comes through the work of Christ on his behalf. God has sent his son into the world to bring you near to himself. He causes you to choose him. He causes you to delight in him. You are a child of God in Christ Jesus. The righteousness which you need to be justified has been attained it's finished why will you turn to sin now 
Repent. Fellowship with the Lord. Renew your mind with the, the text. And see what the Lord God has done for you. You know, and there's much to be had from seeing the person with the works. When you see the works of God, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, you're getting uh, from the Word of God and history. You're getting more knowledge of the Lord. And it should be appropriated by faith and lead to greater worship. The last one on this is... You must worship and glorify God accordingly. So, look at First Chronicles 28. There, under this heading right here, there could be a, a, a ton of things. Trust, adoration, prayer. But I want to look at First Chronicles 28. 9. As for you, my son Solomon, know the God of your father. There's the know. Know the God of your father. This is David talking to Solomon. So what is David's knowledge of the Lord? David, look at the Psalms that he wrote. Look at how he was with Goliath. You have defied the living God. His trust in God and his fellowship with God through the gospel was deep. And he says to Solomon, my son, no. Okay? And serve him with a loyal heart and a willing mind. So under here, a subpoint would be, Sir, you must worship and glorify God accordingly. And that would in- involve... You serving him with a loyal heart and a willing mind. That loyal heart is a whole heart. It's not a partial heart. It's not faithfulness to say that I serve the Lord with 70% of my heart. If you go to an interview and you stand before your panel of people who are interviewing and you say, Well, yeah, I would really like this job and I think you all have a very good uh, offer on the table but um, I'm just letting you know up front, I'm planning to work 70% of your work hours, and for 30% of your work hours, I'm going to go hang out with my friends. And then when I do work, I'm going to do it with half a heart. I'm not going to really be that diligent at it. If that's evil in your sight, how much more to have that attitude with God? Think about that with a marriage. Uh, yes, I, I desire to be wed to you, but twenty uh, percent approximate, um, I have some desires for another woman, and I plan on like uh, entertaining that by spending some time with her after we get married. That's evil. But why will we do that with the Lord? Why will we put up idols and worship them and say that this half-hearted lukewarmness or partial love for the Lord is what He desires? I know you're not perfect. I'm not perfect. But what I'm, what I'm saying is do not allow that sin to take reign over you by the thought process that lukewarmness is what God desires. Adoration in Psalm 95. Trust in Proverbs 3. Prayer with thanksgiving in Philippians 4. I could keep going. It involves many things when it, we say you must worship and glorify God. And what it forbids primarily, or some key sins forbidden, is atheism and idolatry. I didn't have time to read Isaiah 44, but the Lord gives a test. And it's a good... Isaiah 44, 6 through 23. I recommend you write that down at the very bo- bottom of your page. Isaiah 44, 6 to 23, and read that. Um, but we can be atheists practically when we say, uh, when we justify sin as if God doesn't see us, or He doesn't know us, or we deny His existence in order to do that sin. 
that's a form of atheism, and the, the, this commandment forbids that. All right, let's pray and we'll, we'll close. Uh, were there any questions? Okay, let's pray. Father in heaven, uh, we praise your name. Uh, Lord, I know that um, this commandment exposes sin. And I thank you for, insofar as I'm able to see that, and not that I would stay there, or that that in and of itself is the good, but that I might come to you in Christ. I thank you, Lord, for your salvation in him, and I know that it's certain. Help me and help us, Lord, to turn away from idols and false gods, to no longer entertain besetting sin as a God that could deliver when it can't. And um, through this command, Lord, I pray that it would uh, lead to the sanctification of your church for your glory. Amen. Thank you.